Well, let's dive in the deep end, Bishop. Can you remember what first went through your mind when you knew, when you learned you'd been elected Bishop? It was a surprise because uh, I was shocked too. Because, oh, yes, you're there, and yes, you think it's going to be a possibility, but when it actually hits you, it's, you know, going on your brass bishop takes you outside, and the gather throng is outside. And to be honest, of course, I've, for the 45 years of my ministry, I've always focused on trying not to be bishop. And I still think I'm not sure I did the right thing. Uh, certainly, um, I was happy as Dean, and I left the cathedral with stuff I still wanted to do. But in the circumstances, I felt I couldn't say no. Had you ever thought you might be a bishop? No. In fact, I'd taken active steps to make sure. Mm. You know. I guess, though, that a lot of the skills and knowledge you acquired as Dean were actually very useful as bishop. No. And they're not because people forget that it's not a sort of graduated hierarchy. Uh, being a dean is an entirely different job because you're focused on a place, you're focused on a building, you're focused on the worship which that place offers and which it's about. Um, and you're focused really because of the nature of the building and the nature of the site on looking after a uh, grade one his uh, grade one listed building and an ancient monument and of course welcoming people to the site. I always made the comparison in the fact that the dean was there all the time, the track was a, a fixed target, whereas the bishop is a moving target as he moves around the diocese. And certainly I can't do the job from here. It doesn't work. Or in front of my computer. It doesn't work. You have to go out. And in the Anglican polity, of course, the single minister is the bishop, and his patch, his parish, is the diocese. And obviously, I can't run three counties on my own. So therefore, you share ministry. You don't evolve it. You share ministry with your clergy, with your readers, with your worship leaders, and with, with others. But both jobs require a degree of diplomacy. Interesting point. Um, I suppose I've never been particularly diplomatic. I have learnt, really, not to say stuff. Um, and it is interesting, I suppose, that I always say that the mark of a priest is the teeth mark in it, of her tongue. Um, diplomatic? I don't know. I'm, I suppose I've always looked for the big picture, not the detail. If you get the strategy right, and give yourself enough time to do it. I suppose that's the main thing about being bishop. I've done nearly eight years. It would have been better had I had another two or three. You know. But if you look at it, uh, Bishop George had to go nine years because of his health. Bishop Ivor just did five. Uh, Bishop Hugh did five and Bishop Carl did six. You know. and they're far too short. I mean, the implication of that is whoever succeeds me, whoever he or she may be, has to be, I suspect, in the early to mid 50s to give the diocese the 15 years or so that it needs in order to settle it further. You've packed a lot into your almost eight years though. What do you see were the biggest challenges facing you when you first arrived in the job? I think the main challenge was to keep the diocese together and to keep it settled and to keep it focused. We were lucky, of course, because we were in the venturing in mission campaign and we had to move forward from that, hence the growing hope um, strategy. Uh, it's interesting when you look at the fact that I'm the 128th Bishop of St. David, so if you look back over about 1500 years, um, the Anglican Church doesn't do quick fixes. The Anglican Church shouldn't do quick fixes. I mean, far too many of those over the last. Um, 50 years, some of us remember the Faith and Family campaign back in the 50s and the whole sequence of all the other stuff after. That's one reason why I suppose what I wanted to do, and I noticed I actually said it in the um, uh, interview in the Western Mail back uh, eight years ago, was to get out into the diocese. So I did that first of all in 2009, I went around all the, all the deaneries. And then as we were moving through into the change landscape of the strategies, we looked at the direction we were following. It's fairly clear that there's a communications issue. Obviously, in a diocese this size, 
and as diverse as this science, uh, as diverse as this science is, you really need to be able to tell people directly. So that, I suppose, was what drove me to do the in the steps of um, of St David. Uh, and before I retire in six weeks, I suspect I will have completed the 330, which is remarkable. I never thought I'd be able to do it, but uh, it's been probably, to me, the most useful thing I've done. I hope others have found it as well. You rattled off a list of uh, bishops that, that, that I guess you can recall and maybe had dealings with. How do you think the role of bishop has changed even since their time? That's a very good point because I suppose the church in Wales took decades to recover from the trauma of disestablishment. <clears throat> uh, it had been four dioceses within the province of Canterbury, certainly found itself cut loose. And indeed, in the Welsh polity, the diocese and the bishop are more important than the, than the, uh, than the province, certainly as compared to English bishops. We are not suffragans of the archbishop. It's, if you like, six independent fiefs inside a, um, a federation. Um, it is also at the same time true that we cannot operate in a promise as small as this unless we operate collegially. And that's certainly one of the uh, most important places where I find the energy and the support uh, to do what I do is when I talk to my, to my fellow bishops. As to the changing role, I'm not sure that the role has changed or that it should have changed. There is no template for bishop, is what I'm saying. So if the role changes, uh, it doesn't change. It's the circumstances in which it's exercise change because it is a shepherding role. Uh, and that's how I've seen it. And that's why, you know, if, having been a country parson, it's really being a country parson at large. You became bishop and immediately you were looking after uh, a, a huge diocese mm. uh, and very many clergy. Now um, it's what um, f 45 years since you were made deacon and 45 uh, 44 years, yes. a, a priest. 45 years next month actually. How do you think the role of a priest in the diocese has changed in that time? Well there again you see um, I was brought up in a vicarage and my father was a scholar, Tractarian, not a Anglican Catholic um, he'd been a Methodist and then a uh, Welsh Methodist and then came over to the um, church in Wales through the influence of J.B. Thomas, who was then the vicar of, um, of Bath. Um, so I've been used to the stuff from the inside and certainly my father was a regular visitor. He'd take me out in the car in the afternoon and he'd go and call the people up to the farms and whatever. And that, to me, is the basic. What you do in church, the whole balancing business of, of worship. You're bringing what you experience during the week to the altar, but you're also taking that back out. And I don't think that's changed. It shouldn't have changed anyway, because certainly, all right, I know that social patterns have changed. I know that you can't do, as I did when I started, morning in the study, afternoon after visiting, Saturday uh, um, evenings in, in meetings. Um, but you need to impose some sort of structure on your, on your ministerial life. A bit of a change of gear. You, um, you met and married Diane um, a little bit later than, than many people do. <laughs> oh, ta who's talking about diplomacy now? <laughs> but uh, I wonder what you would say about the extent to which that has helped you. Oh, it's, ma it's massively happy. I mean, having somebody else in the house for a start. I was a confirmed bachelor. I'm an only child. Um, and as you know, only child, only children grow up in an uh, adult world, or the aunts and, uh, and whatever. Um, and just having someone there to share your life with, I mean, that's the main thing. It's the best thing that ever happened to me. You know, uh, I'd be a sort of, not sort of, what did George Carey call the Church of England, a toothless crone mumbling in the corner. I would might well be that without her, you know. <laughs> And she's immensely talented. I mean, uh, when I see her potting, it's unbelievable. Because my great grandfather was a carpenter. Well, I can't hit a nail in straight. And as for doing stuff, craft stuff, I'm absolutely impossible. So I uh, yes, yes. And I guess it's always nice to have someone to come home to, 
and and just uh, re and just relax with and and yeah, you've yeah, yeah. you've had there have been quite a few hot potatoes during your eight years as bishop. I mean, we've had uh, women's ordination first, mm -hmm. and then uh, women bishops, uh, same-sex marriage, mm -hmm. to mention but three. How did you approach these really potentially very divisive issues? Okay. I'm, I suppose, personally and socially fairly conservative. Um, but my initial um, academic interests were in, in the classics. Well, obviously, you've got the whole of that enlightenment stuff coming through. Uh, and I'm an archaeologist by uh, avocation, so the same thing that you look at stuff in that uh, in that way. Having said that, it is no different really from the social conditions which the church has had to deal with over its 1500 years. You know, the whole issue of slavery, for example, is uh, is a parallel. How we dealt or didn't didn't um, deal with that. And I have to say, um, certainly when I was ordained, I was very much against the ordination of women until I actually worked with them. Um, and then, as Warden of Ordinance back in the 70s, of course, I was interviewing people, and the quality was absolutely superb as women. So, you, there's no way that they uh, should not be ordained. And once the Church in Wales decided that women should be deacons, then very clearly should, uh, there should be no barrier to their being, being bishops. I suppose the difficulty is in a diocese like this, and, and I will say it, that it's very socially conservative in quite large parts of it. So would I want to wish it on a woman? But well, that's a different issue. And certainly if they've, if they've been elected to the Episcopate, then clearly people have discerned in the qualities which are necessary, whatever those qualities are. You know, and, and after eight years, I'm still not <coughs> absolutely clear what a bishop is. Were you aware that the reaction in this diocese w was, was, was different from that in other dioceses in the province? Yeah, in what sense? Uh, to, to some of these hot potatoes, yes. um, and particularly yeah. on same sex. Yes, um, uh, as I say, I, I was born and brought up in this diocese, and it is quite socially conservative. And of course, if you kept your year on the ground for the last 30, 40 years, um, we've seen it coming. You know, it's, it's, it's been an, uh, uh, an issue which is waiting to present itself, and now it's presenting itself. Now, one of the um the initiatives. Yeah, issues, yeah. One of the sort of major uh, initiatives has been the the diocesan strategy. Yeah. And um, it, it's represented a big a sea change really in 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 the way lots of things uh, uh, happen. Good. <laughs> but you, I I don't know. Do you feel a bit disappointed not to be able to see it through to the to to completion? Good heavens no. I mean, I, I said at the beginning, A, it would take as long as it takes, and knowing this diocese, it would take a generation or more. I always remind people <coughs> that the big thing with change Anglicanism in the 19th century wasn't the evangelical revival, or indeed the Tractarian revival. What it was, was the parliamentary legislation from the 1830s, which actually redistributed incomes and um, sorted out the anomalies and got people to reside in their, in their dioceses. But they respected life interests. The legislation was passed in 1835. There were still people in the 1880s who were under the old regime, but they took the wrong view, and that's one of the things I think. You know, it isn't so much diplomacy; it's it's patience. That you know, if it's worth doing, it is worth doing. <coughs> excuse me, but it will take a long time to do it. So what? It's nothing to do with me, because you're dealing with um, uh, currents, if you like. Uh, which are moving of their own volition very often. You just have to direct them where they should, uh, where I you think, think they should go. I think you've won people over to to a large extent, haven't you? A lot of them. Well, I'm not the one to answer that <laughs> question, am I really? Um, I don't know. If so, good, you know. Because um, I, I, I don't like the word strategy really. It's a direction. And if you think of the fact that we've got uh, a founding bishop uh, who wasn't, as everybody used to think, a sort of pilgrim going around from one place to the other, in fact people came to him. Um, on the other hand, the whole sort of movement, pilgrimage ethos, is something which I've always found attractive. And certainly having had 14 years of Dean, having to respond to that, then the whole issue of moving around 
and getting people to move with you. But, see, that's the tension. That's the tension because we're also a church, Anglican church, which has got a lot to do with being rooted in communities. Um, and therefore, the places which we use, which are centuries old, some of them, quite a lot of them actually, um, it's that tension between movement and yet coming back home. And um, this is why when we've been talking about things like focal ministers, I've reminded people that the Welsh word for fo focus means hearth. So it's the Aylwyd, come back home. But you go out from it again. You know, there is, is this uh, dynamic, I hope. Now one of your other passions I know is um, uh, ec ecumenism. Yes. And you've been yes. very involved with Katine, you've yes. been on the board yes. of Katine. How do you feel about the progress or lack of it in forging better ecumenical links with the other Christian denominations? Right, the, that's, that's a very interesting point actually, because certainly forging better links, uh, yes, there are far, far better links because we meet uh, with each other, because we talk to each other, because now, for example, the venture bishops. Um, the church leaders in Wales come and see the bench every every year. Sorry, uh, yes, every year. And every other year, the Welsh bench meets the Roman Catholic bishops. So on that level, it's um, it's very very good. At local level, there are ecumenical initiatives, largely to do focused out of things like Christian aid. You know, working together on the um, uh, on the practical side of Christianity, which are brilliant. You know, and uh, 60 years ago they wouldn't have happened. It's the stuff in between, it's the structural stuff. Now, at the moment, the, the Church in Wales, um, having, through Gwynach Gwilym, God rest him, who recently died, uh, produced, a, um, I thought, a very imaginative way of getting people to talk about Episcopacy, don't use the word episcopacy or bishops, episcopacy, the Holy See of, of oversight. And of course, there's far more convergence than we, than we think. And you know, when you think about the Methodist uh, Church of England covenant, which is something you wouldn't have thought after the disasters of the 60s, excuse me, <coughs> when uh, ecumenical progress was blocked. Um, so, institutionally, no. And it's not. Uh, the fact that, um, if you like, it's to be a marriage of corpses because all of us are on our last legs. I don't think that's true. Uh, and that is certainly not true as I go around the diocese. Even very, very small churches have got life, you know, which is what I had uh, expected. And very often they've got very good relationships with their free church or Roman Catholic neighbours. Um, institutionally, I think it's going to take at least two or three generations. Otherwise, um, you you got, I suppose, and and, uh, and and give up because every so often, ecumenism takes like a great leap forward, and then it takes several great leaps backwards, or it doesn't move at all. I think at the moment we're in a sort of um, not in an ice age. I think the glasses are melting, but when it comes to creating a, a uniting church in Wales, then I don't think that's all people's agenda. They're more concerned with their own denomination. And that's, I suspect, is true of us. Their own that. survival. Yes, but it's more than survival, because what they're doing, when you're in, in um, a mode where survival is, is a question, you actually go back and look at the roots from which you, uh, which you come from. I think that's, that's mm -hmm. also happening. So the, the great um, hopes of the 1960s simply haven't happened. But the covenant, we remind people, the covenant is a covenant before God in Wales and it survives. Whether the commission will survive in its present form is something else. So there's room for hope and there's room for a lot more effort. It must be it's actually working. It's must a watermill that's working. Right. Mm. And what, um, he reads? Yes, he reads you mentioned earlier on that in an ideal world you'd have liked to have served for maybe longer than eight years. Yeah. If you could have had two or three more years, what would you like to have done with them? Well, um, to make sure that the momentum carries through. Uh, all right, I've been able to go around all the churches, I've been able to present, if you like, the case for what we're doing 
And I'm absolutely astonished, because, as I've said frequently from the pulpit, uh, having the word change and the word diocese of St. David's in the same sentence is not normal. But it's happening, and I will have inaugurated 19 local ministry areas. That's unbelievable. You know, so the, there is movement. Um, yes, I suppose, just to see that through. I'm just, but of course, I would have probably seen something else in Egypt. You know. I cannot sit in my house. I said that when I came, became bishop. You know, I, I'm, I, yes, obviously I'm transitional because of my age and uh, and the uh, and the nature of the of the diocese and, and my I suppose my calling is to move people on. So it's ready for my successor, whoever he or she is, to be able to take it. Say if they're in their mid fifties and actually move it, move it on. Now you're within. Is it ten churches of completing yes, your? Sir aim of visiting every church in the diocese. Mm. It, it, no mean task, but it, it must have been very satisfying. What have you enjoyed and, and noticed? Oh gosh, oh. first of all, it's strange to say I was brought up in this diocese and there are churches I've never been into. Now I have. And um, not just because of the buildings, it isn't just the that but having said that, there are some remarkable um, buildings, some remarkable pieces of art in, in the building, both in terms of stained glass, but also in terms of fittings and especially of mural tablets. You know, I have a thing about mural tablets because um, social history, national history, local history, it's all on the wall, you know, and it's there and you found out quite, like, quite a lot. But it's the fact that um, there are congregations, very, very small congregations, which are still putting life into the buildings. Do you think we, we tend to take our churches for granted because we're in them every Sunday? We don't really appreciate them. That's right. Um, and the other thing is that they're not used as imaginatively as they might be. Because the whole issue of pews, you know, and I always encourage people to take pews out. And I speak as the former chair of the DAC, I have absolutely no problems with people taking pews out just to put the flexibility in. Um, and to make them the community buildings they, they were till the Victorians went and, if you like, sterilised them, pickled them and put everybody into their, um, into, their, um, into their places, you know. So you'd be up for things like liturgical dancing and yes, messy yes. church, godly play, well, all of those? Messy church is fantastic. Um, there was, I, I use this as an example. There's one little church uh, which was the church of a big house. The big house has been sold and now all the farms have been sold around, so suddenly there are young families and children. And the congregation is very small in number and elderly, but they've said we'll do messy church. And they have done messy church, because I was asking the other day. And there's so much like that, you know. I don't know if this is the case. Maybe you can tell me. Is there ever a sense in which you, the, the, the diocese is within, within the province? compare each other? I mean, do, oh, do you sit there absolutely. comparing? Oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Well, as I make clear to my fellow bishops very often, I look at Pobble Derry and I say, it's the streets ahead, you know, and some of them agree. Uh, it's, as I say, it's, it's an interesting point as far as the bishops are concerned, because yes, there are only six of us. Uh, plus the assistant bishop, and we do, each of us has our own portfolio, and, and you know, we, we try and take collective action, but also I'm responsible for the diocese, and you know, that's, I make sure that, that we, for example, uh, one of the things I'm, I suppose, quite chuffed that I managed to get off the ground is the whole issue of the non stipendiary local ministry. Now, I was warned of ordinance with this diocese back in 1978. And in the couple of years before that, I was responsible for the training, devising the training course and delivering it for the non stipendiary ministry. And there were lots of people there who had had a vocation, who still had a vocation, but had not, for various reasons, been able to express it. Um, family, jobs, and, and so on. But when they had the opportunity, they blossomed. And that was good. And of course, they were local because PCC had to say they would support them. When I came back as bishop, it was clear that that had slightly changed, and you had non stipendiaries who were now deployable. And yet there were lots of people, and you could see them in congregations, of course you can, uh, like yourself, who had a vocation, and therefore, you know, that should be expressed. Now, 
there's another issue here, of course, which is the whole issue of the delivery and the provision of ministry. And this diocese used to have 200 and something clergy. The first Church of Wales Review said, really, the pension fund can only take 84 for this diocese. And my predecessor rightly, and I have said rightly, you simply cannot do that. 84 stipendiaries, but that does not mean that we cannot utilise the talents and the vocations of those who are prepared to be non-stipendiary. Um, and if you looked at that, there were, I suppose at that point, about 100 stipendiaries. There were about 100 readers. There were about 100 worship leaders and church wardens, because church wardens have their uh, role in this too. And um, I said to the readers, you know, I will ordain you. So I didn't say that. I said, I can ordain, remember? Mm -hmm. I said, I can ordain all of you. And what happened from that, that some um, conversations happened then between the Bishop of Bangor and myself, and between Professor Leslie Francis and um, Sue Jones, and Dr. Sue Jones, and uh, Dennis and myself, and the exploring faith concept in Bangor. Yes, a discipleship course. Absolutely, because where else should you get your clergy or ministers from unless out of the local congregation? I've got nothing against the seminary model, because I went through it myself, but there's something about growing your clergy organically, which is what we did in the 18th century. The local grammar schools, the divinity classes produced people uh, until, not Burgess, but Burgess's successor actually stopped that and said, if you want to do that, you have to go to London. But anyway, uh, we then decided that we would start this, and I'd seen the possibilities for ministry. So we went and did it. Um, I've ordained 23, 24 to the LSML. Now, uh, my fellow bishops were not happy at all, um, but I banged on with it because, as I say, bishops are sovereign, and I'm the one who ordains, not collected with the province. And um, it's happened, so I'm quite pleased about that. I just hope that my successor carries it through because, I mean, cases in England where a bishop has done this and then his successor, or well, it usually is his, his successor, has said, I'm stopping it. But in the one case, which that was fairly notorious, before the end of his episcopal the chap was saying, well, you know, it's a good thing that they was reinventing the wheel. Don't want that to happen. What do you think? you'd like to, I mean if you could wave a wand, I know it's not very spiritual, but <laughs> wave, wave a wand I'm and... Not, I'm, I'm not on the door, I haven't, <laughs> got, I haven't got the beard just <laughs> But um, if you could just uh, have have one thing change, what would you what would you change or what do you feel could have been done better? When you look at the diocese, one of the things I've encouraged, and I wish some of my younger clergy would taking up is the fact that we are a very, very rural diocese. And certainly I was extremely glad to have been associated with the Tio Dewey initiative. Mm -hmm. Because again, if you've been a country parson, you know how much modern farming impinges on the people who are practicing it, who are depression and huge rates of um, um, suicide and so on in the, in the past. Anything can be done to, to stop that. So that is something which um, we hope takes off. Mm -hmm. If it's proper and if it's right and if it works, then let it run. That's not the problem. You should not interfere. Because when I, when I was a child, I remember my, I took my grandmother's alarm clock to see how it would work, and I took it apart. It never worked again. <laughs> so you know that's, that teaches you really it's just to let things run and let people and trust people go with it. And that's that's the main thing. When I look at the clergy of the diocese, there are huge variations in the way they exercise ministry, but they're immensely talented. And that's the other thing that I, and I've said it to them in the, in the blog really, and I've said it at other times, that the clergy do a remarkable job, you know, uh, both stipendiary, non-stipendiary, and the sort of focal ministers who are now, now emerging. That, that, and that's heartening because people tend to slack the clergy off. They tend to slag the church off in terms of, of, um, of decline. Well, it depends how you measure decline. 
And when I see such as one which I, uh, which I was vicar had eight on the books, it had had eight on the books in 1971 when it had its, its own last independent party, it had eight on the books in the 19th and 18th and 19th centuries. It's never been big, you know. And um, I remember Tony Crockett saying, a satsuma is not a failed orange. You know, they have their own dynamic, they have their own life, and we need to foster it and to nurture it. Retirement beckons. Yeah. It's, well, a few weeks away. Six. <laughs> not that you're counting. <laughs> no, no, no. How will you fill your time? What will be the things okay. that you're going to well, get your teeth into? Well, I think that the first thing is having time for Dan and myself. You know, that's hugely important. Um, secondly, is I, well, as you can see from this room, I've lots of plastic boxes. It's not packing, it's the sort of talks and lectures I've given over the last several, several years, which I now want to pull together, so I am going to do some research. And I've also said I'm not going to ask for permission to officiate for at least two years in order to get that off my chest. And then I need to get back to my real research, which is the pre-conquest church in Wales, which still bugs me as to how, you know, I've never believed in this Celtic church nonsense, but what happened in the change in the 10th, 11th and the 12th, 12th century? But if you could scribble down a little bit of advice and leave it tucked under the, under the desk for your successor, what would it be? Well... I hope it would be different from the time when the um, Conservative government came in and defined that there's, there's no money in the kitty. There is money in the kitty because we're very, very lucky with the Jones of Yeshke, um, um legacy, as of course the, um, the cathedral has been with the minor legacy. Um, just bang on would be my uh, advice. You know, this is the stuff, this is what's happening. Um, carry it through. I, I've, I've always operated under this kind of um, uh, regime for myself. You take about three to four years to read the back bearings, to see how things are working. You then take three to five years to put stuff in place. And then, that's a difficult bit, then the last three to five years, see if it was working, if you have the courage to undo it, okay? I haven't had the 15 years, have I? <laughs> So therefore, yes, um, take it slowly. <laughs>